That is how we measure success in the Western world is through square footage and money and status and achievement and followers and more and more and more and more. If I just purchase the right things, I'm successful. If I have the right logos, I'm successful. If I have the emblem on my car, I'm successful. If I have more square footage, I'm successful. If I get even more than that, I'm more successful. But you know what comes along with that? More discontent. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. I'm here with my good friend and co-host, TK Coleman. Hey, it's good to be here. Cheers, everyone. Alabama's here. Hi, everybody. We've got the rest of our team in the studio as well. Coming up today on this free public minimal episode, a caller has a question about holding on to useless things. And another listener has a question about managing loved one's expectations. Then we've got our lightning round segment, a fam's question, and a listener tip for you. You can check out the full two and a half hour maximal edition of episode 417, where we answer five times the questions and we dive deep into several simple living segments. That private podcast episode is out right now at patreon.com slash the minimalists. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free because say it with me y'all advertisements Advertisements suck suck. let's start with our callers if you have a question or a comment for our show you can give us a call 406-219-7839 or email a voice recording to podcast at the minimalists.com our first question today is from holly hi i'm holly mckay from jacksonville beach florida I was the mad scientist at my kids' elementary school for five years, and I created unique lesson plans and hands-on experiments that made it real easy and fun for the students to understand and really love science. And each of the 40 lessons are are highly organized in individual binders and correspond to their own storage box that holds the corresponding props and visuals. But they're currently taking up the entire space of a 5 by 10 office slash guest room closet. And although they're neatly put away and I really don't need the space, it just seems so silly to hold on to them and bugs me for some reason. My kids are now in their early 20s, so it's obviously been a while. I do occasionally access them when my young nieces or nephews have a science project and my niece in her late 20s always encourages me to hold on to in case she becomes a teacher someday as she dreams about. But I know what you think about holding on to the what ifs. I wish I could sell because that would make it easy to let go. I would be willing to donate to a really interested school or homeschool mom or ambitious teacher who would honor them properly. However, the the time it would take me to explain each lesson and the props, it's just not worth it to me. But I, I absolutely cannot just toss or donate aimlessly. I loved, loved, loved what I created and put my heart and soul into them. So it's really a special memory for me. But I would love your advice. Thank you. Well, Holly, you certainly know I don't have any advice for you, but I've got some observations. I've got some insights based on my own experience and also the experience I've seen thousands of people go through. You talked about, TK, those what ifs, the stories we tell ourselves. That's just another way to say just in case. But here's another way to say just in case. Whenever you're reevaluating your material possessions, what if instead of saying, I'm going to hold on to this just in case item, I'm going to hold on to this useless item because Mm. that's really what just in case means. Mm. This thing is useless. I'm not saying that pejoratively. I mean it literally. I am not getting use out of this item. It's Mm. not amplifying my life in any way. It's not even adding some sort of aesthetic beauty. In fact, it's clutter in this respect because why? It is getting in the way. Anything that gets in the way is clutter. Anything we're holding on to just in case means I don't have a use for it right now. Otherwise, I'm using it. It's not a just in case item. It's a useful item. The opposite of a useful item is a just-in-case item. Mm. And she's holding on to it for a few reasons. Oh, just in case I don't lose the memories. I love, love, love these items. No, you don't. You don't love the items. You love the experience. Those items were able to help you create and curate during the time. However, you're past that time now. And now you're saying, but maybe my niece, who's in her late 20s, maybe she'll become a teacher someday. I'm not sure, By the way, she's in her late 20s. Has she not made the decision yet? Hmm. And if she wants you to hold on to them, great. 
offer them to her so she can hold on to those things and you are no longer burdened with them. Yeah, I do want to acknowledge one unique challenge to Holly's situation. Sometimes clutter is the result of over-consuming. And when it comes to something that we've consumed, we can make it about ourselves and tell ourselves all kinds of stories. But the pair of shoes I bought, it's not an extension of me in the same way as things that I create. My creations are an expression of my uniquely human energy. And it can be really hard to let go of something that you put a lot of time into creating from scratch. So becoming a teacher and creating those lesson plans, that's years and years of effort. Over time, you learn new tricks, you you, you evaluate what didn't work and you rework it and you have something that is like gold. And when you get to a point where that's no longer useful for you, it does feel uniquely wasteful to just throw away in a way that maybe an old t-shirt doesn't quite feel. So I I do understand that. And I appreciate you wrestling with it. And I'm, I'm just grateful for the fact that you are in the kind of situation where this is a problem that you're dealing with because you invested so much heart into teaching and into making science fun. Like big shout out to you for that. We need more teachers like you in the game. One thing I would say is that I think about all the new teachers who are so overwhelmed. I've had many friends like this over the years who are in their first, second, third, fourth year of teaching. They still have so many things they're they're figuring out. They have a lot of imposter syndrome, a lot of insecurity, and they would really benefit from having resources like what you've created over time that they can look through and choose from and, and, and mold and shape to their own uses. And I think what's needed here is just a way for those people to know that this is there without you feeling overwhelmed by some need to explain every single element. I thought the way you phrased your question was brilliant and the world just needs to hear that. I would suggest something along the following lines, making like a five minute video where you pretty much say what you said to us in that question. And instead of pressuring yourself to explain everything that you've created over the years, you can say, let me give you a few examples. And I'm just going to take three things that I've created so that you can get a feel for the types of resources that I have here. If you like one of these three things, or if you got one cool idea from these three things, then I've got hundreds more of those that I've built up over the years. If you want part of it or the whole of it or half of it, you can reach me this way. I think some video like that will be, will be immensely helpful. You can even take some pictures and show. It, it all depends on how much work you want to put into it. But all people need to know is that this exists and that it's available. And I don't believe it will take long for someone to reach out to you because there are literally thousands of teachers. And you put some video out there like that. I'll even do it with just what I have here. But I can share that with people. There are a number of different schools out there. I can email that to them and say, hey, any teachers interested in this? And we can get somebody to take that off your hands. And more importantly than just getting rid of that clutter, we can give you the joy of letting you know that, hey, here are some teachers that have found a lot of value in what you've created. There's a lot of narrative overlay here. And what I'm hearing from you is decoupling your identity from the past. You did these things and they added a lot of value. And by the way, if someone simply handed you all of these beautiful lesson plans, you got 40 of them, they just handed it to you, you wouldn't have any problem letting go of those, right? Because there's not the narrative of like, this is a piece of me. This is something that I created. Here are the memories that I have that surround these things. If someone just handed you a box of stuff that wasn't important to you ever, it's really easy to let go. But there's more than one story here. That, that's also one story. The other story is, I don't have the time to get rid of these things. Well, that's a story as well. Maybe if I were to rephrase that story for myself or reframe the story for myself is, man, I don't have the attention to keep paying to these things that have been, they've become useless. They've rendered themselves useless. I've gotten the use out of them, but I can't keep paying attention to them. Why? Because I'd rather take my time, my energy, my attention, all of my non-monetary resources, and I'd rather focus those resources elsewhere. So yeah, you may not have the time to try to sell these things, but you know what's more important than that? 
oh, the burden that they've created. I no longer want the burden, so I'm willing to spend an hour or five hours or 10 hours to remove this burden, to decouple the material possessions from the memories themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's exceptionally difficult, but um, but you, you've got what it takes to overcome that by finding new ways to be creative that are an expression of the person you have evolved into now. Can I throw one more little idea out there of something else you could do? If you're up for it, first, just make that video. And if you share it with me, I can get it to some schools. But if you're up for it too, if you're still interested in teaching on your own terms, not having to go into school and do all that other stuff, you could make a five to 10 minute video once a week, once every other week, once a month, whatever predictable and feasible schedule works for you. And you can take one little lesson plan and it can be how to make science fun. And every time you show up for five to 10 minutes, you're going to take one thing, you're going to show one thing, and you're going to tell a story about, hey, here's something that I learned from my years working with students. Here is a tip that's worked for me when putting across this idea. Here is a common fear that a lot of my students brought into the science classroom. And that's something that could be a lot of fun. You could still make use of your teaching chops. You can show up and work when you want it to work not for long at all. And that's something that several teachers can find a lot of value in. And then this material ceases to be clutter because you've put it back into the sphere of creative expression. I like this. I see a new career, a budding career for Holly, the mad scientist. And she already has a name for her YouTube channel yep. now. <laughs> and you can even have a theme song. Have a holly jolly Christmas. Uh, a holly the jolly science, maybe? <laughs> Holly, thank you so much for your question. Our next question today is from Tom. Hi, guys. This is Tom, a Patreon subscriber from London. I have a question for you. In my mid-20s, I moved into a 500-square-foot apartment with my wife. We both have great jobs, we're happy in our smaller home, are child-free by choice, and are content with the comparatively low bills and mortgage-only debt. My parents are incredibly old school and associate property size and type with success. In a recent conversation with my dad, he said, I kind of envy how you live comfortably with money behind you, but do you really want to get to your old age and realize that you only ever achieve Achieved what you did in your 20s. You're not having kids, which is fine, but what is the point of life if you aren't going to grow? He knows that property prices in my local area are insanely expensive, and to purchase an 800 square foot house will cost us more than 50% of our take home pay in mortgage payments and bills. We also refuse to measure our success by what we own. I have explained all of this to him, but despite this, he still persists in telling me that what we have is not enough. How can I manage his expectations without causing unnecessary conflict in our relationship? Tom, it's not your responsibility to manage anyone else's expectations. You can try to if you want, but other people are always going to have expectations that don't align with your own expectations or your own standards for your life. And really what you're talking about here is the difference between the standards for your life and what someone else wants for you. The first thing I'll say is they're not wrong. That is how we measure success in the Western world is through square footage and money and status and achievement and followers and more and more and more and more. If I just purchase the right things, I'm successful. If I have the right logos, I'm successful. If I have the emblem on my car, I'm successful. If I have more square footage, I'm successful. If I get even more than that, I'm more successful. But you know what comes along with that? More discontent, more misery, more dissatisfaction. There's an inverse correlation between success and satisfaction with one's life quite often. And well, why is that? Because yeah. you're constantly living up to the expectations of everyone else around you. You're trying to manage their expectations or perform up to their expectations. Here's the problem with that. If you try to perform up to someone else's expectations, you'll get there. But then they'll have another expectation. Or once you meet one, they'll hurl two or three or ten more expectations at you. And what happens then? You meet a few of those, but you feel like a failure because I didn't meet this expectation or I didn't meet this expectation. Or let's say you meet yeah. every single one of their expectations, but you are below your standard. You're not achieving your standard. Now you're all of a sudden discontented. You've made yourself unhappy. Well, why? Because you've 
tried to meet their expectations and you haven't paid attention to what does growth look like for you. They ask you the question, what's the point of life if, if you're not growing? Okay. There's more ways to grow than simply growing your square footage. There's more ways to grow than growing your material possessions. There's more ways to grow than growing your bank account or your net worth because your worth is not determined by your net worth. Your net worth is a measure, but it's certainly not a measure of your success right. or your happiness. Your square footage is not a measurement of your contentment. Your material possessions are not a measurement of your well-being. And as soon as you understand that, you can let go of other people's expectations. Absolutely. I mean, if your doctor tells you your condition has grown quite significantly since the last time I saw you, Ooh. is that good news or bad news? We don't know mm. because growth isn't inherently good or bad. It's not determined by the quantity of expansion, but by the quality of expansion. And so you want to focus on more than just the accumulation of things, the accumulation of stuff. When you're making money and reducing your debt, you're accumulating purchasing power, you're accumulating flexibility, and you're growing in the direction of things that can't be measured by the amount of clutter in your home or by the size of your property. 10 years from now, if you and your spouse decided, hey, we wanna make this kind of move, we wanna start this kind of business, we wanna move to this kind of city, it's gonna be a lot easier for you to do that because you're not weighed down by all of these things and you've been spending your years growing in your purchasing power, in your asset accumulation because of the financial frugality that you are now exercising. So what kind of growth is necessary to have meaning in life? That's what the conversation needs to be about. But hey, Josh, let's role play for a quick second. I want you- I'll be the to- nurse, the sexy nurse. <laughs> Stop, oh my stars. I knew when, when it was coming out of my mouth, when I was saying role play, I, I wanted to pull the I words back. I watched him get so excited and he lit up and said, oh yeah, keep going. <laughs> right. Uh, it was it was already too late. I couldn't <laughs> take the words back. Oh, it's time to take your temperature, TK. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I want you to tell me um, that I'm not growing enough. That you are not grown enough. Okay. Yeah. So here's a way that I would say that if I was being judgmental. Yeah. Hey, man, what's going on with your house? Like, it's not as big as I would expect. Oh, yeah? Why is that, man? I just because, you know, someone is as, as successful as you, someone who is as impressive as you, they should definitely have more square feet. Yeah, that's interesting. Is that what you would do if you had my money? Oh, definitely. Yeah, what kind of house would you get? Oh, man, I would have like, I think I'd have a, like a little McMansion in the yeah. suburbs. Yeah, <laughs> three car yeah. garage. Okay, okay. Yeah, big basement. Hey, I hear that. I'd have an uh, entertainment room <laughs> next to my living room. <laughs> okay, that's cool, man. That's cool. I like that. I don't know that about you, man. Switch it up. Tell me in a different way. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, you know what, TK? I saw the car you were driving here today, man. Yeah. I mean, it's cool. It's fine. It gets you from point A to point B, but yeah. can't you afford something better? Oh, yeah. Probably could afford two or three cars, man. Well, why don't you? Why don't you get something nicer? Yeah, I like this one. You don't like it? I mean, no, nah, it's not for me. Yeah. What would you get? A Range Rover. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of? Yeah, the 4.6, the new ones. Oh, that's what's up. I don't know you like Range Rovers like that. Oh, yeah. They're my favorite. Oh, that's cool, man. Isn't that easy? <laughs> that's suspiciously easy. Like, right. wow. Like, when I don't need to defend myself against you, and I can be honest about the fact that your judgment of me is based on ideas that truly are interesting, right? If, if it is of your opinion that I need to have a car other than the one I like for myself— that's fascinating. Like, why is that? Yeah. And, and, and is that what you would do? Oh, wow. What kind of car would you get? Like, what would you do with that car? How much would you enjoy it? Interesting. Yeah. Okay, man. You can't do anything with me when I'm talking to you like that because just like tug of war, we can't have a game unless I'm pulling the other end of that rope. But if I let go, there's nothing for you to do other than run backwards until you fall down or just give up. Yeah, well, what, what people often try to do in that game of tug of war is, hey, you let go of it. So I'm going to go over there and tie the rope around you and <laughs> right. start pulling on it. So I'd like to reverse this a bit because really what you're talking about here is disarming the other person, yeah. not escalating. What TK did was de-escalate there. I'm going to show you how I would do it. It's a little bit yeah. different from TK. It involves less curiosity and it's slightly more dismissive. <laughs> 
but it's because I often yeah. don't even want to get into these conversations. Yeah. So I love TK's approach, if, yeah. especially with your parents. I think it r- makes a lot of sense to get curious. If it's with a coworker or just a random passerby, let's do the same thing here, but we'll reverse our roles. Josh, I appreciate the fact that, you know, you got a small place and saving all your money, but what is the point of life if you're not growing? I'm not sure what you mean by growing. Can you explain to me? I mean, you don't have any property. You know, you don't really have an estate. What are you doing, man? Like, what are you making your money for? I understand. Yeah, man, like you, you really need to grow. I mean, you're, you're, you're growing older. One day you're going to retire. You don't want to look back and have any regrets. You need to grow, man. You need to get on it. As you say. Yeah, seriously, man. You, you really need to do something. I understand. Those two phrases, the I understand, what I'm really understanding is I understand that you have that expectation of me, but I don't have to pick it up. As soon as I pick it up, now I'm carrying it and it's a burden. But if I don't pick it up, how do I, I don't never have to set it down in the first place. If I simply say, I understand, I understand where you are. And I know that's disarming. And if they keep coming at me, I give them those three words. As you say, that's like saying in a very kind way, we'll agree to disagree. As you say, Josh, you should have a bigger car. As you say, you should have a bigger house. I understand. You know what, man? I don't like the way you spend your money. As you say. And it's so disarming. Those are two great ways to disarm someone. It's either, hey, I understand, or or, as you say, or as TK said, you can get really curious. Oh, Tell me about how you would spend my money. And as soon as you say that in a non-defensive way, it de-escalates the entire situation. Tom, I'd love to send you a copy of our book, Everything That Remains. We're coming up on the 10-year anniversary. In fact, who knows? We may even be planning a tour around the 10-year re-release, a beautiful new cover that's designed by this really talented Mexican artist. She is stunning. The, the, the artwork is unbelievable. It's now my new favorite book cover. You'll be able to see that really soon. I'd love to send you a copy of Everything That Remains. It's still my favorite book that we've ever written. If you like our podcast, you'll enjoy the audiobook version of Everything That Remains, or if you want the book book or the ebook version, Well, we'll be happy to send those to you as well. It's a book about setting down the expectations of others because throughout my 20s, man, I picked up a lot of expectations and I was really successful. Why? Because I met this person's expectations and I met that person's expectations and I carried all those expectations with me until what? Until they broke me and I could no longer even meet my own standards. I lost all of my fulfillment and satisfaction. I certainly wasn't living a meaningful life. Well, why is that? because I was living up to everyone else's expectations. And that book is really about untangling from those expectations of others so I could figure out what's my definition of success? Who's the person I want to become? Why have I been so discontented by all of these material possessions and all of the status that was supposed to make me happy? And it it actually did the opposite. Mm. So Tom, if you enjoy our podcast, you'll enjoy everything that remains. Alabama, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your questions from TikTok. Yes, indeed. You can follow The Minimalists on TikTok, also on Instagram and Facebook and X and Threads. We are at The Minimalists on all of those platforms. Now, during the lightning round, we each have 60 seconds to answer your question with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We call them minimal maxims. And we put these minimal maxims in the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. Today's question is from Tama. Anything kept in a storage locker is obviously something you don't need. So why are people okay with paying extra rent just to store their excess stuff? Other than for temporary use or transitions in between residences, it boggles my mind that people pay money to hold on to things they'll likely never use again. You know what? It boggles my mind too, TK, but I'd like to address this first. Let's give TK 60 seconds. Give us something pithy. All right. Every storage locker is filled with stories about the difficulties of letting go. Uh, We've all heard the old saying that we tend to judge other people by their behavior, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. 
your behavior is obvious. My intentions are invisible and only accessible to me. So when I cut somebody off on the street, hey man, I'm just running late, but I mean, well, when you cut me off on the street, it's because you woke up this morning with the express purpose of making my life difficult. I refuse to forgive you, you're evil. And so the trick is to step back and give people that same grace that we extend to ourselves, which is to acknowledge there's a story behind the things that you do, even if I wouldn't do them. It's the same thing for people who fill their storage containers with a whole bunch of stuff. If you want to understand, don't say, hey, I would never do that. That feels more virtuous, but it doesn't move you closer to being able to influence people or empathize with them. Ask what's the story behind it? Because sometimes the story is compelling. It's a heartbreaking story that will make you say, yeah, I get it. Keep doing what you're doing. Other times, the story is a sad one that makes you say, oh my gosh, are you really that weighed down by things that are holding you back from your best self? But because you took the time to listen and learn, you'll be in a better position to support them in the way they need. I totally agree. Clinging is often shaped by the stories we tell ourselves. Yeah. I couldn't possibly let go of this. I'm going to hold on to it, even if it's useless. Even if it would be useful to someone else, yeah, it doesn't matter. And if I don't have space for it, what do I do? I put it in a storage locker. I put it in a basement, which is a type of storage locker. I put it in my garage or I put it in my attic or spare bedroom or closet. I find space for it. And when I've run out of space, what happens? I put it in a storage locker. I pay money to hold on to useless things. However, when I look at other people, If you want a recipe for misery, worry about what other people do with their material possessions. Mm. And that's ultimately what's happening here with this question. Why do all of these other people store their stuff in storage lockers? Why do you care? It's none of your business why other people keep their stuff in their storage lockers. It's not your storage locker. You can let that go. You can let them cling to their stuff all they want without needing to change them. And if you let it go, well, then you're not worried about their stuff. And you cease to cling to want to change people. You don't have to change them to understand that they're not ready to let go yet. doesn't mean you have to hold on. Mm. We're going to answer one of our questions from the Patreon Zoom call. We do all of these. We do these once a month, uh, the first Friday of each month. We call it the Friday afternoon minimalist Zoom, the fams. We got a question there that Alabama has for us. But first, real quick for it right here, right now. Here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. Alabama, you wanted me to mention this. We have 100 free local meetup groups, minimalist.org. Minimalist.org is the website. And there's meetup groups in a hundred different cities. We did this nine years ago. We set up, we planted all of these different meetup groups. We went to every city, eight different countries. And we said, hey, we're leaving today, but we're leaving behind this free local meetup group. And there are many groups that are super active and engaged. They're meeting monthly. There are other groups like the Alston group who might need a new group leader. There's a lot of inactivity there. And so wherever you are, there's probably a local meetup group close to you. You can find them over at minimalist.org. And speaking of meeting with open-minded or like-minded people, I have something in my notes here, TK. Sunday Symposium is coming back. Question Woo! Question mark. Woo-hoo! <laughs> that was good, man. About the rewind. <laughs> Alabama and I yesterday we went to a new venue close to West Hollywood, yeah. and I think it is a great space. It is smaller than where we were before, yeah. But it has the one thing that we were missing from our previous venue. We had a great venue before; it held only two hundred people. This one holds. Just around 100. We're going to try and cram a few more in there. So you want to get your tickets as soon as they're available. SundaySymposium.com. By the time this episode is out, maybe they will be available. If not, just put your name on the email list and we will notify you as soon as we have announced the future Sunday Symposium. What we're trying to do is create this community space in Los Angeles. And what I like about this new venue, there's a whole lot of space for mingling and meeting other people. You don't have to do that. You can show up and be a fly on the wall as well. That's what I would do. You can be in the audience. You can watch the show. Me, TK, Nicodemus, Malabama's there, Danny, Professor Sean. And you can show up and you can enjoy the show. And you can also, if you'd like, meet some open-minded or like-minded people locally. Yeah. 
and build that sense of community. Yeah. Sundaysymposium.com. What's your favorite thing from these events, TK? The opportunity for connection, which is why I'm so excited about the exploration of new venues because I want something more than and different than church. I love church, but I don't need the minimalist for church. And no one out there needs the minimalist for church. We're not a church. That's not what we do. It's a community of people who can come together and connect in whatever way we want to connect at that time. And so being able to just chat with each other, converse with each other, and in, in the most agenda-free manner possible. That's cool. And so like our previous space, it was really awesome and it was great, but it sort of lent itself more to kind of like watching a show. And a lot of the time beforehand and after wasn't as easy to engage everybody. And so some of these newer spaces will allow us to blur those lines between when a show has began and when it has ended. And I think that's going to be really nice. That's what I'm looking forward to because I, I, I want to meet you all and I want you all to meet each other. And, and I just love the possibilities that come from the relationships we build. From Alabama, we went out there yesterday and I really enjoyed the space. We're looking at early December for this, by the way, for the next Sunday symposium. Stay tuned for that. But when Mal and I were out there yesterday, it is a theater, but it is a theater that's sort of in the round. Yeah. And there's all of these community gathering spaces outside of the venue. There's also like a yard where people can set out blankets and there's all kinds of stuff. It's indoor and outdoor at the same time. And to me, it felt so much more like a communal space where we can interact with each other and blur those lines, as TK said. Absolutely. When I think about how we sneak in the hug line at the tail end uh, from the previous venue, it was cool getting to bring people on stage for that. But when you're on this formal proscenium style sage, it makes you feel still a little bit disconnected from the audience. This, it really does blur those lines and it makes it really feel like you can just reach over and put your hand on someone's shoulder and be like, hey man, I'm so glad you're here. Like that genuine kind of connection, you could reach out and really feel people's energy, their excitement, all aspects of this space, I'm so stoked, dude. And yeah. we're going to make it super accessible. The tickets will be really cheap. We don't want to make any money from this. We want to break even on these events. I'm not allergic to making money, but that's not the point of doing these. We just want to be able to pay for the venue without coming out of pocket too much money. But there will also be some free tickets for folks who can't afford to buy a ticket. We want to make sure that we make this accessible. The only problem is they're all going to sell out. All the 200-seaters always sell out. The 100-seater is certainly going to sell out. So grab your tickets while you can. Sundaysymposium.com. One last note for right here, right now. Malabama deserves a Grammy for last week's private <laughs> podcast performance. Oh I agree. I oh. agree. <laughs> if you didn't listen to episode 416, it was the most fun episode yeah. that we have done in studio. Nicodemus was here and she stole the show. We did an advertisement <laughs> suck segment where she was reading the Bernstein Bears book about how advertisements suck. They were saying advertisements suck before it was cool to say that. And she did all the different characters and just a hilarious voice. And then we did this McSweeney's article about Autumn, which is not for children. The or episode, for me. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, but you repeat myself. <laughs> you should have I was cracking up 80% of it was like just me laughing at how Mal was reading this hilarious article but the other 20% were the facial expressions with which Danny captured masterfully he panned you right at all the right moments but Mallory I've just got to say your performance in the last episode on the private podcast it is worth the cost of a mission, y'all. So try it out seven days for free. Patreon.com slash The Minimalist. Speaking of Patreon, we do once a month a Zoom call with The Minimalists. And you can hop in there. You can be a fly on the wall, turn your camera off or turn your camera on and have a conversation with me and TK and Nicodemus. And Malabama's there. Danny's there. The professor's there. We collect some questions while we're doing those. Do we have one today? We sure do. This one comes from Bridget. What are your thoughts on feng shui? Bridget, feng shui. Mm. I have, you know, I always thought, oh, it's a little woo-woo for me. But then when I started to dig into it, when I first embraced minimalism, I understood, oh, I don't have to accept every tenet of something in order to find value. And so feng shui literally means wind water. 
to be fluid, right? And when you walk into a space, feng shui is about having a fluid space. And isn't that ultimately what minimalism is about? You know, later in this episode on the private podcast, we talked to Kelly and Juliet Starrett about mobility and being flexible in your body, but also having a flexible space, a space that feels really open and inviting. There is something to feng shui, even if you don't subscribe literally to every tenant about feng shui, but I would love to do a full episode about feng shui. Let's bring an expert on and we could talk about this wind water concept. So if you get a little weirded out and it feels a little woo woo to you, feng shui, there's an energy in my space. Okay. I think there's an energy to a space. When you walk into certain spaces, you feel chaotic and stressed and nervous Or other space you walk into and you say, ah, full body sigh. That's feng shui. Absolutely. So first you make me think about the uh, animation film, Spirited Away, where there's a character who is injured and the little magician puts his hand on the injury and says, by the power of the wind and the water within the unbind her. And then she's healed. And kind of the, the idea there is that There is spirit behind every problem. And if you deal with the spiritual or core nature of it, then the symptom is resolved as opposed to just dealing with the outer aspects of things. So that's what this makes me think of. But, you know, when it comes to what do I think of feng shui or any of these things, there are two ways you can listen to that kind of question. One you can say is, all right, uh, am I willing to defend this as objectively truthful and universally necessary? Mm, I tend to step back from most ideas if you ask me that. On the other hand, if you're asking, hey, do you think there is any way to frame or understand the ideas there that can be useful for you, me, or someone else? I think, oh yeah, when you're creative enough and active-minded enough, thinking critically about all things, you can get value out of just about anything and you don't have to accept something wholesale or make yourself an apologist of it in order to find usefulness in it. And one of the things there is the idea that the way places are structured or designed or arranged do affect our disposition. And you don't have to believe any woo-woo to understand that. You can read books like The Architecture of Happiness or The Poetics of Space to understand that where the doors are in the room, where the hallways are and how long they are, how high the ceilings are, the amount of lighting in the room, all of these things, if there are flowers or plants in the room, if there are pictures or no pictures, windows or no windows, All of these things affect your disposition and anything you can do to wake yourself up to that so you can take charge of that process and make life better for yourself, you can call it what you want, but it's useful. We got so much more to talk about, TK. Malabama, what do you got for us first? Here's a minimalist insight from one of our listeners. Hi, my name is Brooke and I'm a Patreon subscriber. I used to be a marketing director before I found minimalism. Now I live in a tiny house that I rent, which allows me to pay off student loans and save. I am an artist. I think the beautiful thing about life is our purpose can change with the seasons as we do. I have found many different crafts in the past, but right now I'm narrowed down to bead and leather work. I don't promise myself or anyone I'll do this forever. But right now I'm finding it to be satisfying work. Letting go of past identities is crucial for happiness today. It's like a sunk cost. When you purchase something that you think will be great and turns out to be a burden, you can't change how you spent your money or time in the past, but you can practice being who you are today. All right, y'all, we'll see you on Patreon for the full two and a half hour maximal edition of episode 417, which includes three guests on a private podcast, an interview with the mobility experts, Juliet Starrett and Dr. Kelly Starrett. They're the authors of the new book, Built to Move. We also get some financial insights from our friend George Camel from The Ramsey Show and a bunch more listener questions we're going to answer. And we take a look at a private minimalist home tour from one of our patrons. And if you're still on the fence, here's a testimonial from one of our lovely Patreon subscribers. Alexa says, I am very excited to be a part of your private community, especially after debating whether or not to join for over a year. I heard about you guys when I saw your first documentary on Netflix, and I've been amazed ever since. I subscribed to your Patreon because I wanted to dig deeper, and I've been loving every minute of your private podcast. It changed my life. I only wish I would have joined sooner. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Alexis. 
Now is a great time to join. Patreon is offering free trials so you can test drive our private podcast pack podcast for seven days for free. Just head on over to patreon.com slash the minimalist or click the link in the description to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You'll also gain access to all of our podcast archives all the way back to episode 001. And that is our minimal episode for today. If you leave here with just one message, let it be this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Peace. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it.